We got this little robot friend here in his terrarium. She used to be a fridge. Uh, the compressor doesn't work. It doesn't refrigerate anything. It just looks cool. And houses tiny little robots. This guy needs to recharge, though. Hey, Vector. Go home. You can do it. Okay, so now it's charging, which activated the power bank. Which is like his food. But as you could see, when it lit up, it's only two lights out of four. It's half empty. What are we going to do? Now, we could just plug this guy into the wall, which is what I normally do, but we could also power him from alcohol. Yeah, like the robots in Futurama. This is a Stirling engine. If you're not familiar, uh, you probably have heard of internal combustion engines, where the combustion happens uh, inside. This is an external combustion engine, where the, the combustion happens outside. Uh, the benefits are that it's much more efficient, up to 50%, and it really closely approaches that. Uh, that's the Carnot limit. Whereas internal combustion engines don't really come nearly as close to approaching that limit, but their uh, their power output is greater. These things really only work decently as generators because they like to run at a single speed for which they're optimized, and that you can't really modulate their output um, without stopping them. I made this out of a kit that I got in the mail, and I soldered wires onto here instead of connecting the light bulb that you're supposed to. Uh, to this USB charging module into which I have plugged the power cable that goes down to the robot's battery. And now we're going to engage in what is perhaps the most foolish and inefficient spectacle of how to generate your own power that has ever been seen. Now it does take a minute or two to heat up. And this engine type operates on thermal differentials. You have to get one side of it hot, and the other side has to be colder. This makes it ideal for use in situations where you have a natural thermal differential, like, say, Antarctica or on a submarine. Swedish submarines, some of them, use Stirling engines as air-independent propulsion, and they burn liquid oxygen and um, vent the re resulting gases, but the Stirling engine is, is quieter than a shaft-driven nuclear submarine, it turns out. And using them as electrical generators is, is perfect for that application. You, it, a Stirling engine really doesn't care where the heat comes from or where the cold comes from. You can do it however you want. There are solar-powered Stirling engines that use mirrors to concentrate sunlight onto the heat receptor. There are nuclear Stirling engines, which are called R2Gs, which stands for Radioisotope Thermal Generator. Uh, and those are just Stirling engines that use nuclear material to generate the heat and then use radial heat fins to get the other side of the engine cold. Anyways, it should be warm enough now. Here we go. Now you're playing with power. Now if you really want to see it go crazy, you, you should remove the load. Here. Whoa, shit. It really goes nuts. Because it's not powering anything. As soon as you put a burden on it like that. Now it's still going. You can see it flashing. I've plugged it all the way back in. Now we're making our own electricity at home from alcohol. Only about 400 milliamps. Sadly. That's not a lot. That's uh, enough to charge a battery. 
but you can't charge a cell phone from that. They won't even recognize less than 500 milliamp hours because they have CPUs that have parasitic background processes sucking down the amps. They have scre screens and all this shit that batteries don't have, and batteries will accept almost anything. So there are some useful things you can do with this, but it's a lot more useful when scaled up. And as you might imagine, there's a market for homesteaders. Uh, you can get Sterling engines that are designed to run off of wood pellets, and they're really quite a good op uh, option for people who want to generate electricity without having to buy liquid fuels. I bought a bunch of gate valves. I didn't know what size I would need, so I bought the three that were closest. This one... Uh, the opening fits inside of the tube if I push hard, which, you know, it should seal anyway pretty hard, but it's too small for the gate valve. And if I get one of these with a smaller opening, then it won't fit the holes that I've made. Um, so that's no good. The big one, the opening is the same diameter as the gate valve. That doesn't fit unless I get a slip junction between these two. And then... Uh, I, I can fit the tubing inside the opening of the big one, but then I have the same problems with sealing it that I had when I was just connecting the tubing directly to the gate valve, so that's a non-starter. That's wasted money. This one is exactly the right diameter to snugly fit in here with some epoxy, prop, maybe some bolts as well. So that's good, but uh, the opening is the same diameter as this tube, so I cannot slide the tube over this like I hoped I could. Even if I could, then I can't unscrew this because this has to be able to come back. So I don't know what the answer there is. Maybe a slip junction between this and the clear tube? Because if I get a wider diameter tube and connect it to here and slip it on, I won't be able to unscrew this part like you're supposed to be able to do. So I thought there's got to be a better answer because this is already too bulky if you look at it from the front. There's too much shit hanging off of it. There's got to be a gate valve that already has a threaded connector on it, and there is, right here. Um, these are just about perfect. I'm thinking really seriously about replacing these completely with these. The only problem with these is I don't know what will connect to here. The corporation that makes these valves does not appear to make junctions or hoses of any kind that attach to here. This has got to be some kind of standard. There's letters on it and numbers. I think it's upside down. 1008-2 but I can't as yet figure out where to buy a hose with a, a fitting that will connect to this. If I can then problem solved. Uh, that's great but that's where I am in terms of the, the fittings. Not a lot of progress to report sadly. I'm still researching and, and ordering samples. Oh, and uh, this part, the smallest of the junctions, it doesn't go on to here. That would be too perfect if it did. I mean, the opening is just barely large enough for the hamsters to squeeze through comfortably. But still, that doesn't fit that. I don't know... I don't know what fits that. I guess I have more shopping to do. While I was at it, I also picked up some other essentials, like this lab coat you guys requested. Personally, I find it kind of cringy when these are worn by people with no medical or scientific credentials. But you got to give people what they want, especially on the internet, because large groups of people on the internet are scary. I also got a Dr. Pepper to go with the lab coat. I am a scientist. An intellectual beverage for chosen ones. It's so cool, instead of a bitch. That's all for this time. Not much else to report, except that I'm refurbishing Handbase Alpha. I used cardboard as an insulator between the heating pad and the floor. It just got gross enough over time that I decided to scrape it out. I don't think I'm going to replace it. I think I'm just going to glue it directly to the floor, because in the past, it's never really needed insulation. It's been warm enough that the hamsters sleep on the edge of it, not directly on the pad. So I think I'm just going to super glue it directly onto the ground this time. Uh, lots of cool surprises in the pipeline for the next video. It should be more eventful than this one was. Um, what else? Oh yeah, hit up that merch shop if you want to support me, uh, whether or not you're a patron. Although if you're like me, maybe uh, you're running on your last couple pennies as the end of the month is coming up. But I appreciate everything I get from you guys. It really helps me uh, continue to create this weird shit.